Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who's doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who's doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who's doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these 
because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Welcome into Cross Christian Fellowship Wednesday night service. We're going to talk a little bit about the uniqueness of Christ and evidence for God reaching out to us through him. You know, Jesus made a radical claim. He said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if you were just looking at Jesus as some kind of moral teacher or um, some kind of ancient sage or some person who was, uh, you know, a social revolutionary, this would be a radical statement because this puts him apart. This actually makes him almost to be crazy, right? Because you're, if you're making statements like this, exclusive statements, that he is the only way to God, that no one can know or understand truth except by him or through him, then that is a radical statement. And you would need some good evidence to back it up. You don't need radical evidence. You need good evidence. Evidence is evidence, right? And so when he says these things, there's a key to this. When he says, I am the way, how can someone call themselves the way? Well, think on this, that if God created the heavens and the earth, in other words, the universe, then he would transcend that universe. He wouldn't be in it in the sense of being part of it. The creator would be separate from the creation because it didn't exist before he created it and he didn't create himself. So he would transcend creation. And if you and I were part of creation, then he would transcend us. So how would we be able to know him? The only way is if he would give us access, if he would ascend to us in a way that we could know him not just know of him. The heavens declare the glory of God that there is a creator. But it doesn't tell us a lot about the creator. It doesn't give us a personal relationship with him unless he ascends to us because he's transcendent. So when Jesus says, I'm the way, he's making a bold claim. And it's logical, it's reasonable that if you are the only way, if and there being only one way because we can't reach God, he must reach us. And he's not reaching us through multiple venues because they're contradictory. You can't have uh, Islam being right and Christianity because Islam says there is no son of God. Christianity says there is. And Islam basically is just saying God speaks through prophets. Well, most religions will say that, but where's the proof of this? Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the road map. There was a, a scholar, a researcher, who wanted to cross this vast desert in Africa. Well, they told him, look, you need to get a guide to get across this desert. Because there are many ways, but you could go away and find yourself dead because you've chosen a wrong way. So he hired this guide, they get to the edge of the desert, 
and this guy's looking around, this researcher, and he's going, there's no roads. There's not even like a dirt trail. It's just sand. There's the, and there's dunes that are ever shifting. So there's, there's not like any mark points or significant, you know, monuments that you could use as a waypoint. And he was like, where's the roads? Where's the, where's the markings? Where's the, where's the waypoints? And the, and the guide says, I'm the road. I'm, I'm the map. I'm going to guide you through this. This is what Jesus is. See, without God ascending to us, there's no way for us to get to him. And because he reached to us and, and ascended, we now have that path. So when Jesus says, I am the way, he's making an exclusive argument that is, actually it's helpful. People sometimes get mad at that. How can you say, how can you have such privilege or be so snarky to have only one way? It, it would stand to reason that if there is only one God and he created and he's reaching out to us, that would be the only way. And it would be foolish to think of any other way. I love this in Romans 5, 1 through 2, it says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom, through whom we also have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have access through Him. And it's by faith you have to trust that He is the way. And we're going to talk about why you should trust that. Because <clears throat> Jesus said, not only I'm the way, but He says, I'm the truth. Not, I have the truth. He says, I am the truth. Which would make sense, again, if He's God, and He's the only access to God, and God is the creator of what is reality, because truth corresponds to reality. So God made our reality, right? And the reality giver would be the truth. He would be the one that could tell us exactly what's going on, have the proper perspective from not only now, but from eternity, from the creator standpoint, from having all knowledge, being transcendent. His truth would be it not the most accurate truth, he would be truth, period. No error in him, no faults in him, no sin in him. So this is a claim of exclusivity. It's a claim that says there is no other truth but this truth. People get upset at that now because they've been geared to, to think like, that's, you know, exclusive, and you shouldn't have the only truth. Why? Why? There's nothing wrong with that. Truth, by definition, is exclusive, right? It's not random. You don't randomize truth as a, have a random genera generator that's going to input certain words or phrases or truths into something and just make it up. When you go to your bank, you want to know that there's $4,000 in your bank account, not 400 right? Or if it's 400, not that they come back and go, well, it's 40. No, that's not the truth, right? Well, to us it is, ah, it doesn't work. See, when, when people say that truth is relative and you can't say it's exclusive to this or that, they don't live by that. That's only a way to get out of what Jesus said. He is the truth. He's the truth giver. He's the standard of truth. And because of that, we need, to, we need to trust Him. You go by the facts. You go by the evidence. And He gives us plenty of evidence in that. The idea that you just take everything on face value and don't dig into what really happened is, is not something that is you do in the world, right? Because you can get into a lot of trouble on that and you can get a lot of things wrong if you don't find out what actually corresponds to reality. Let me tell you a story when I was a chaplain with LA County Sheriffs and I, I had a call out, or I didn't have a call out, I was doing a ride along with one of the sheriffs and we got a call out 
the deputy and I went to a scene where a woman had had an aneurysm uh, on her front porch. She fell down her front porch steps. Uh, her husband was distraught, and she was um, she was dead on arrival. Very sad thing. And so I was comforting the husband. The officer was looking around, and I, and I started to notice some things. You know, after comforting just hundreds of people, being a pastor, being a chaplain, I don't know, maybe even into the thousands, you notice when there's something askew, something people are holding back, and I began to think, this guy, there's something with this guy. He's shaken up in a way that is not normal. Most people are, they're in denial, they're... Um, you know, they can't believe that their loved one passed on. Uh, they, oh, well, I wish I could have done something. Instead, he was more of the fact of, oh my gosh, she's dead. She's 100% she's, um, dead, and this is 100% health problems. And I'm like, most people don't put the emphasis on that. They're not so much concerned with the cause unless they didn't know the cause and they want to know. They don't kind of ramble on about it. And I told the officer, I go, something's kind of weird here. And he's like, I, I think so too, but it's up to the detectives to find out. So here's this woman. She had been bleeding from the nose. She had some health issues and they thought she had, uh, you know, blood vessel burst in her brain and, and she had this leakage in, in her nose. <clears throat> but when they got to you know, the detectives arrived, they began to look around a little bit more and they found a revolver underneath the staircase. And the husband had an alibi and there were some people who said that she just fell down who were across the street. They didn't see him shoot her or anything like that. He was standing in front of her and she just kind of fell straight forward. So they thought, well, maybe it was a suicide. She shot herself, walked outside, had the gun in her hand, you know, sometimes people don't die right away, and then the gun fell underneath. But when they did further testing, what they found was she did have gun residue, gunpowder uh, gun residue on her palm, but not on her wrist. When they tested him, he had it on the right hand and he had it on his wrist. So they, they put two and two together when it went to autopsy, they found a bullet in her brain and what had happened was he finally confessed is they had a fight he was leaving she came out called him a name he turned around he had a little 22 revolver and because his back was to the neighbors they didn't see him shoot and the bullet went right up into her nostril and there was no evidence of a gunshot wound because it had entered right in through her nostril when they dug through the evidence they found the truth when you dig into the evidence, you find the truth about God. Some people deny that there's even a God around. But you know that because we have the universe, it didn't start on its own. We know that it had a beginning, right? Because we have the second law of thermodynamics. You can't have energy going on forever and ever. It's a closed system. You don't have something putting energy into the universe from outside. You have a finite amount of energy and eventually like a candle that you light up, it burns down and runs out and goes cold and, and dark. So is the universe. It's slowing down, it's going cold, it's going dark. It may take billions of years, but it's headed that way. So it must have had a place where it ramped up, where it started. And we also know that you can't have an eternal universe because you can't have an infinite regression of time. You, you would never get here to this time if time didn't have a start, right? If, if there were an infinite number of days in the past. Because even if you had a billion years go by, 10 billion, 100 trillion, a, a quadrillion number of years come, that would still be in the past because you would still have an infinite number of years and days coming up to this point and an infinite number of years and days coming going beyond this point 
you could never get to this point. Say you went a quadrillion amount of years. How many years do you have to still get to this point? Because remember, you don't have a starting point, so that goes off into infinity. Yeah, you never get to this point. So you can't have an eternal universe. So what happened? Since something doesn't come from nothing, since things can't make themselves and pop into existence, you, you have to have a creator. A creator brings this into existence out of nothing but his own power and will. He would transcend it and then reach out to us. So we see things like incredible design. We have morals that go beyond uh, animals. We have intellect, logic, all these things that point to a creator and a system and a world created for men. <clears throat> In all this, um, when he says that I'm the way and the truth, if he's the creator and he's able to point to these things as being truth, then what we have is that what's the difference between God and the Bible and Christianity and all other religions? Well, there's only three religions that talk about God being the ultimate creator and not being part of creation. All other religions, ancient religions, and every other thing, the God was a part of nature. He wasn't the tr tr uh, transcendent uh, creator of all things. And so, you only left with Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. All the others have God as part of creation since... God didn't create himself in creation, he transcends it, then you left with those three, all the others are then become uh, moot. They, they don't, they're not true. So how do we know his is the truth? Well really it's because of Jesus Christ, the Bible and Jesus Christ. We know that the Bible is written over a period of 1,500 years in three different continents, three different languages, by over 40 different authors, and hundreds of uh, controversial topics, yet it's 100% accurate historically, morally, scientifically, prophetically, theologically, and in every way. That's an ascension from God. Mormonism, Islam, the the, you know, the Doctrine of Covenants, the um, Joe's Witness, New World Translation, you have the Quran. None of these come close to holding water close to the, to the Bible. They don't have any, anything that's near as historically accurate or prophetically accurate. And the idea that this Bible came to us shows that Christianity is true as well as Judaism, right? Judaism just stops at the, new, the Old Testament and doesn't enter into the New Covenant. But we also have Jesus, who came and he gave his life for us. Um, and in this, this is part of the evidence that he gave. And John 10, 24 and 25 says, Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? Like, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered and said, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do are my fa in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So here's what Jesus is saying. Look, the Bible is true. Well, I don't believe the Bible. Well, it gave you the truth. You, you may choose not to believe it, but it is true. If he's the way and the truth, he's the only access to that, you can believe it, it's the truth, and everything he says is the truth, then... The promise of that is he's the life. He's the life giver now in a physical life, our, our physical, we're, we're born underwater, we're born in the flesh, but we can also be born in the spirit. And that's the life that he's giving. And so we begin to see in John 11:25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. This is, this is powerful. So he's the way, 
He's the access. And what he says is true. He comes in truth. He comes in peace. He comes sinless. He comes loving us. And in that, he won't force himself. He says, but I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is the resurrection. Do you believe that? If you believe the first two, you've got to believe the last one. Because the last one causes a change in our life. I love what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. He says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So it effectively works in the people who are trusting in it. That's the end game, right? That's the scenario of what does this matter? If he's the way and he's the truth, then what matters is he's the life. He's the life giver. Not only sustaining us, like in presence, okay? You're living, you have an existence, but is that really life? See, there's two terms of life, right? Because you, you can have a consciousness, but some people say, the life I'm living is not really a life. It's, it's hopeless, it's full of anxiety, it's full of depression, it's, it's not really life. When he says, I bring life and I give it abundant, and this life has joy in it, then it's meaningful. You have a meaningful life because this life has a purpose. This life has a direction. This life has a plan. And this life has an afterlife because if you're doing things now and it makes no difference now or in the future in a million years from now, life is basically without any kind of significance. What does a kind deed have to do with the future or, or an evil deed? doesn't matter because you're going to die, you're going to be worm food, the earth and the universe is going to grow cold, come to a stop, be dark. There won't be anybody to remember you or think about you and nothing you do has makes a lick of difference. But in Christ it does. It does now and it does for eternity. So he gives us purpose. We have a life in him, not just living, not just existing. We have a life in him. And so if you haven't done that, if you haven't chosen Him, and, and you have this void in your heart and in, in your mind, in your life, like, uh, I'm tired of this life. It doesn't seem like I'm getting anything out of it. There doesn't seem to be any meaning or purpose. There is meaning and purpose. And it's in Him. And if you know Him, walk in that. Rejoice in that. Every little thing that you do is for eternity. Now, with... Out him, if you don't have him, then you, you don't have an access to God. And you don't walk in truth, you walk in darkness, falsehoods. And you don't have hope of life after and a life that's meaningful. So, here's what you do. You just trust him for the work that he did on the cross. Jesus came. He, he, there was prophecy about his life, death, and resurrection. He gave prophecy. There's prophecy hundreds, uh, 1,500 years before him about his life and death. And because he fulfilled that, he did so as a sacrifice to pay for our sins that we might have access to the Father because our sins separated us from him. We had this separation from being in heaven because heaven is a place where there's supposed to be holiness. And Jesus made that way. And he brought truth to us and life. So we just pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me for my sins. Let me have access to the Father. Fill me with your righteousness. I accept your love. I accept your Lordship and I accept being adopted by you. I accept eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. If you've done that, please contact us. Go to our webpage 
at crossfellowship.org. Until next time, love you guys.